on this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. And at the end of all the engineering and writing and flying different aircraft and all these experiences, you're expected to go out and fly an aircraft maybe once and look at the engineers for the contracting company and say, hey, this is wrong. And from a technical expert, like, this is what you need to do to fix it. Like, look at your flight control laws here, or you misjudge the size here, something's wrong with the fuel requirements, whatever. And to have that really in-depth technical conversation with the engineers to fix the aircraft. We've had admirals on this show. Now meet our youngest guest, U.S. Navy Lieutenant Becky Shaw, who tells us all about the Navy's test pilot school. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I am Vincent Aiello, and this is episode 22. We will be talking test pilot school with Lieutenant Becky Shaw in just a few minutes. But before, just want to make sure you're having a great summer and that all is well in your life. It is certainly going well in ours. And, you know, I am just, I hesitate to bring this up because if you're superstitious at all, and I'm not, but, you know, you can't help but be a little bit, I suppose. But, you recall in the spring, there was a big hubbub about the rash of accidents in U.S. military forces. And I'm not trying to say I'm right, but I'm just glad that has died down and it's been pretty quiet lately. And again, I almost hesitate to say anything because you never know. And if something else happens, I'll probably feel stupid. But anyway, I'm glad we're past that. Well, just one big announcement before we get to our listener question segment. We are proud to announce the launch of our entirely new website. It's at the same address, fighterpilotpodcast.com. But I mentioned before that listener Yannick Kraus, who is in Australia, reached out and said, hey, I love the show, but your website's a little weak, and I spent the last two weeks working on it. I want to give it to you pro bono. What do you think? And I was just blown away. I mean, I've had the same success with photographers and musicians, and now I've got Yannick on the team, and we worked together for about the last month, and we just revealed and launched our brand new website. It's got an entirely new layout and design. I think you'll really like it. It's got options now for shopping where you can help support the show and get some of the things we talk about, t-shirts and merchandise as well as books. And eventually we will also have some artwork on there. And also I feature a friend of mine who sells wine and I'll talk probably more about that in a future episode. We also have a tab called Musings, which is a distillation of our newsletters and just other random thoughts. We have, of course, the episodes in the glossary and upcoming air shows if we, in fact, are working with one. So go over once again to fighterpilotpodcast.com and check out the new website. I think you're really going to like it. All right, on to the listener question segment. We've got a handful here, including one phone call. The first is from Lance Tuccio. And Lance wrote me and said that he is named, he's a former Marine rifleman, and his parents named him after Marine Fighter Attack Squadron 212, the Lancers. Now, how cool is that? I didn't think to do that with my own kids, but I probably should have. Anyway, Lance asks, aside from the nine-line brief, what were your procedures, i.e. setting up the aircraft, for working a CAS mission? So again, I think I've mentioned on the show before that CAS stands for Close Air Support, that is aerial attack on surface targets in the close proximity to ground forces, friendly forces. And a nine-line brief is simply, as the name implies, nine items that are provided by someone who is controlling the CAS aircraft. And it is standardized with the format of what line is what and how they give it to the pilots. And we in the aircraft then use that information to set up our aircraft. And Lance wants to know how I set up mine. Well, Lance, you'll probably be dismayed to know that as a little bit of a technology laggard, 
I never used the new cast page that the F-18 became equipped with starting probably about 10 years ago. When I first started flying the F-18 in the mid-90s, we had to just put everything in manually and then make it work out so that you arrived at the target at the exact time. Nowadays, they have this cast page where they can either give you the information and you can enter it yourself or they can actually upload it through some form of data link and you can just accept it and then implement it and the jet does the rest for you. But to answer your question, what I used to do was, of course, I would set up the weapons stores page to make sure I was releasing the weapon that they wanted in the proper configuration as far as high or low drag or fusing, etc. And then I would set up on the HSI, that display right between our legs behind the stick, I would set up a waypoint sequence where I would designate what the target was and then have an initial point getting to that. And then usually you have a holding point as well. And you can build all this into your HSI. And if you put a time on target, which I would normally back up by about 15 or 30 seconds, depending on if we were doing roll-ins or pop attacks from low altitude, then what I would do is I would say, okay, from the initial point to the target, I want to be at 480 knots ground speed. So then I would get a cue in the HUD to say, hey, you better leave holding right now in order to get to the initial point so that from that point on, you can do eight miles a minute over the ground and arrive over the target with 15 seconds to spare, which is incidentally is usually roughly about how long the bomb takes to drop with, of course, some caveats for low drag or high drag and low altitude, high altitude, etc. So I did it the old fashioned way, Lance. I built everything into a sequence. I watched my timing. I held perpendicular to the direction I wanted to go. So in other words, if the run in was to the north, I held in a bow tie pattern east and west so that if I screwed up my timing at all, I could always turn 90 degrees and get going and then just make it up with the throttle. And I used to love CAS. That was a fun mission. And I hadn't thought much about how I set it up until I got your question. So thanks very much, uh, Lance. All right, next question is from Hampus Bankler from Sweden. And I need to talk to you guys about him sometime. He's got this game he's been asking me to share with you, and I will do that on a future episode. But in the meantime, Hampus asks, I understand the normal descent rate for touchdown is around 700 to 800 feet per minute on an aircraft carrier. My question is, for the FA-18C, what span or range, I think he means, beyond that is acceptable? Where is the limit where you would say, ouch, that was a bit rough? And approximately at what rate would the aircraft be sent straight to maintenance for damage inspection? So Hampus, the range on the lower side doesn't matter. There's no minimum rate of descent. So really what you're talking about is how hard can you come down? And it's not just a function of the rate of descent. It is a function of the impact that you hit the carrier with. And it really is a controlled crash. I think we talked about that on a previous episode. So when you're coming down roughly at seven to 800, well, you might get away with as much as a thousand feet per minute if you're particularly light. And maybe the ship, if it's moving at that moment, is maybe going down a little bit. On the other hand, you might be at eight or 900, and if you're right at max fuel weight or max trap, and the ship is coming up a little bit, then you might exceed the limits. And I cannot give you an exact rate of descent, Hampus. I asked some maintenance officers who are friends of mine who I refer to frequently for different questions that I get, and their answers were actually pretty long and convoluted. And I'll distill it down to say that it really comes down to all the different conditions as I just touched on. What is the ship doing? How uh, how heavy is the aircraft? And the airplane measures all that. And if it decides an exceedance has occurred, then you get a hard landing code in your multi-system purpose codes. That's not what MSP stands for. I don't remember what it stands for. But the jet tells on you. And it pops all these different codes if you overstress it or if you land too hard. And a lighter overweight or overstress landing is a 903. And with that, they'll simply take a look at a few things and clear the code. And usually you're fine. But if you get a 904 code, that is a hard landing code. And that aircraft will then need to most likely go down into the hangar bay on the ship and be jacked up and have the landing gear inspected, the struts and everywhere where the landing gear you know, attached to the aircraft, as well as a bunch of different points. And I think I mentioned this either on this show or on a different show I was a guest on. There was a jet with my name on it on my second deployment. 
and the air wing commander did a hard landing at the beginning of deployment during CQ carrier qualification. And that jet sat in the hangar bay the entire rest of the cruise. Before we even left the East Coast of the United States, they flew another one out to us to uh, use in its place. And then much later when I had left that squadron and I was at Top Gun and they had taken it off the ship when it returned from deployment and trucked it all the way across the country, somehow somebody saw the thing right before it got to the depot, which is where I ended my career, where it needed complete overhaul. And it still had my name on the side. It had no wings, of course. They pulled the wings off and just put the fuselage on the back of a truck. And I'm surprised they didn't cover it. But apparently, a friend of mine was driving down the highway and actually saw this jet going down the road with my name on the side. And I thought, all right, great tour all across country of a derelict airplane with my name. Thanks a lot, CAG. But, you know, that's just the way it goes. So it really comes down to whether it pops those 903 or 904 codes, Hampus, and then the maintenance officer and all the folks take a look at it and they decide whether it needs uh, maintenance or not. All right, next, let's go to a phone call. Hello, Vincent. My name is Kevin. I'm calling in from Dallas, Texas. Just wanted to say that I absolutely love your podcast. Um, I want to be a fighter pilot myself one day, hopefully fly some F-16s at the United States Air Force. I have a few questions. First, what was it like for you to get into your first dogfight and or drop bombs on an enemy or shoot down another aircraft like what was your first experience with all of those like and my second question is in regards to top gun how did you get notified that you were selected to go to top gun school and how long did it take from you being like aware that you're invited to actually physically being there at weapons school being like all right i'm actually here i am at weapons school i'm at top gun for real this is it how long did that take and what was that experience like for you that's it for my question Jello, thank you so much. I genuinely am happy this podcast exists. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic day. Thanks for your phone call, Kevin. Let me start with the easy one. I never shot anyone down, so I don't know what that's like. But having interviewed now Viper and Mongo, you can go check out those episodes and you can get their experiences with that. My first dogfight, I don't remember. I mean, obviously, that would have been in training. And for me, that would have been when I was with the Marine Training Squadron in El Toro back in probably 1996. I'm sure I was awful because you're brand new and you've never done it. And I was probably disoriented and trying to figure out where the other guy was. But I got better at it. But I just that's not one of the missions that stands out in my mind, I don't recall. I do, however, remember the first time and only time I ever dropped any ordinance in anger and that was over southern Iraq in 1999 while I was on John F. Kennedy. And there were some AAA guns that were shooting at us, and at the time, things were escalating a little bit, and if they shot at us, we were allowed to shoot back. And so I dropped a 500-pound laser-guided bomb on a AAA site. And, you know, like, again, Mongo and Viper have said, it's your job. You do it. I didn't really think much about it, and... Well, I guess maybe I did because they had told us at the time that a lot of times the gunners would come out, take a few shots, and then run back to their bunker. So I like to think that they came out, took a few shots, and by the time we turned around and dropped our weapons on them that they ran back into their bunker. I don't necessarily need to feel like I killed anyone, and if I did, I'm certainly not going to rebel in it. So I did what I had to do just as they did on their side. Now, for me, when I was notified... For Top Gun, that is an experience I recall. I was sitting at the dinner table with my wife and her parents. We had no kids at the time. They were visiting us in Jacksonville, Florida. And I received a phone call from my friend Jeff Winter, who was the training officer in VFA 86, the squadron I was in at the time. And he was the conduit for me to get there in the first place. He called me up, as I recall, and said, hey, Jello, good news. The bros all met, and they've accepted you. You're in for a class next year. And I was ecstatic. I was a little bit anxious too because I knew it would be a lot of work but I was thrilled at the opportunity and I think the family could see the smile on my face even before I hung up the phone but I remember announcing to them and they all cheered of course my wife had no idea I don't think how hard it was going to be especially by the time our first child came around right when we got there Um, that was I want to say in the summer of 99 and I was originally told I could expect to go in the summer of 2000 and while I was on that JFK deployment Right around Christmas, 
I was told there was an opening in the March class. And so by Valentine's Day, I left deployment a little early, ran home and spent a little bit of time at home before running off to join the March class. So probably about eight months from beginning to end. Great questions, Kevin, and good luck to you, dude on the Air Force and the F-16. I hope you make it. And if you do, I know you'll have a great career. Good luck. Let us know if you make it going forward. All right. I think we got time for another question. Let's go with Dennis. I'm not sure where Dennis Mancilla is from. I think his question was on Facebook. He says, are naval aviators allowed to personalize their helmets and write their call signs on them like in the movie Top Gun? Or is this another Hollywood thing? No, actually, uh, Dennis, this is real except that we don't do it, our parachute riggers or PRs do it, or our air crew equipment men in the different other branches. I think that's what the Marines call them. I'm not sure what the Air Force guys call their folks who take care of their gear. But generally, every squadron helmet will be the same, except with the personal call sign on the back. And then you really can't personalize them much beyond that, except, as I think I might have mentioned before, either here or on a different show, I used to have a small number Oh, that's what it was. I put it on Facebook on uh, Memorial Day. I used to have a number on the back of my helmet, and it simply signified the number of people that I personally knew, not just people I'd heard about, but people I knew personally who had perished in naval aviation. And I want to say the biggest that number ever got was about 15. And there was a time when it was going up one per year, which was really awful. But that just comes with the territory. I think we've talked about that on previous episodes is how dangerous this is. And you have to come to grips with the possibility of death right away. And so, no, you don't customize it. Everyone gets a squadron helmet and you get your call sign put on by the parachute riggers. All right. Well, let's get then to the interview with Becky Shaw. This is going to be a little more technical and detailed than some of the others. We might call it a Black Diamond podcast episode if you want, but I think you'll really enjoy it. And we'll come back at the end and cover just a few things that we talked about that we didn't explain during the interview. But let's get to test pilot school with Lieutenant Becky Shaw. All right, today on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we're taking a slightly different tact. We have Navy Lieutenant Becky Shaw joining us, and we are going to talk about test pilot school. Recky, welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, first off, do you qualify for this show there, Ms. Shaw? (laughs) I can come in and speak as a test pilot who has had the opportunity to fly fighters. Ah, very good. Do the nerdy engineering side. Okay. Well, we'll find out what you mostly fly here in a little bit. But as I've always said on the show, the name I wanted that it made sense to people right away what the show is about. But in fact, we talk about all air combat. So first, why don't you tell us, please, where you're from, where you've been professionally and where you are now? All right. So I'm originally from Little Elm, Texas, north of Dallas, and I joined the Navy because my grandfather had been in the Navy and he had told my twin brother and I stories about his time in World War II and most mostly things that he had done with his friends and and how much he enjoyed it. When we were 10 years old, my twin brother decided he wanted to go to the Naval Academy and be a fighter pilot. Okay. And I was like, good luck with that. (laughs) That should work out for you. Um, The more he pursued the Naval Academy, the more I, I learned about it. And I was like, oh, that seems like that would be a cool adventure. And I looked into it and thought it might be a good fit. So we were lucky enough to both be selected to the Naval Academy in class of 2009. And I majored in mechanical engineering. And that's actually where I learned about test pilot school. I had a professor there who, my junior year, who was a test pilot. I had not seen the right stuff. I didn't know anything about it. She got me an internship down to Patuxent River at the test pilot school. And I was just blown away. Like the pilots were super nerdy, super into engineering, just like (laughs) experts in their field. And it was, it seemed really nonchalant. Like they were just like, I'm just going to go fly the Cobra today, which is the Marine Corps like premier attack helicopter. Or I think I'm going to take the F-18 out for a spin, or I'm going to fly the P-3 out to a meeting in Pennsylvania. And I was like, this is awesome. So that kind of set me on that trajectory in my career you have a lot of different paths you could go down. Some people will go fighters and be top guns. Some people will go into the test acquisition side. Test pilot school is also a discriminator for astronaut. If you look at the last two astronaut boards, I think all the pilots that were selected were test pilots. 
So that kind of set me on that path. I was fortunate enough to get a pilot spot out of the Naval Academy. Went through API, went through primary. I went through Vance Air Force Base, which was actually Air Force training. Okay. The T-34 was like really backed up and we hadn't started flying the T-6s yet. But the Air Force had the T-6 Alpha, like aircraft with like 200 hours on them. Wow. So we, I went through that with the Air Force, selected maritime patrol, which at the time was just P-3s. Went to the Fleet Replacement Squadron in Jacksonville and then won the lottery again and got Hawaii for my first sea tour, <laughs> which was awesome. I can imagine. It was so much fun. We did two deployments to six fleet, so all of Europe and Northern Africa, 300 hours of combat flight time, and then way more hours just being in Europe, staying in hotels, making all the stories you've heard about P3 pilots, the per diem, the partying, like it was phenomenal. I hate you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, after that, you, so I got my 1,000 hours and advanced qualifications, which is sort of the first discriminator for test pilot school, and then you apply to a board. So I was selected for the class 149 in June of 15. We got started. It's a one-year course, finished in June of 2016, and then started my career as a Navy test pilot. I'm at currently at, on my test tour at VX20, and that's like props and big wing. So in the test community, there's jets and then big wing. So big wing's like C-130s, E-2s, E-6, just big aircraft. Sure. It's pretty straightforward. And then right. we have T-6s there. So I've been there for about two years. I've got another year there, and I'm finishing my master's at Johns Hopkins University in my spare time. And then I guess for my final career highlight is being on the Fighter Pilot podcast today <laughs> to talk to real fighter pilots about <laughs> fighter pilot stuff. All right. You're not supposed great. to be so obvious. I'll have to slip you the $5. Okay. Gosh darn it. All right. Well, that's awesome, Becky. And I, I'm tempted to start with the end question on the show because I can't wait to hear how you came up with Recky or someone did. So we'll, we'll wait, though. We'll get okay. to that. All right. So the discussion for today is Navy Test Pilot School, mm -hmm. although if we want to draw some parallels to the others, we can. And for simplicity, let's just call it TPS from here on out. Okay. So hopefully everybody can follow us on that. And I thought the way we would do this is I haven't done an episode interview like this yet, but we'll just do the five W's, the who, what, when, where, why. Maybe we'll throw in some how. And you've already started to touch on some of these. And stories are great. We'll talk about some of those. And we'll just see what we can find out. Now, unlike many other discussion points, I don't know very much about TPS except barely how to spell it. So this will be good. I look forward to learning something. And we look forward to your experiences and expertise as well. So let's start with... And we're not going to go in the who, what, when, why order, because that, to me, doesn't make as much sense. I think we'll start with what. And the name gives it away, Test Pilot School. But what is TPS? So Navy TPS is like one of the four main test pilot schools for the military. There's Air Force Test Pilot School out in Edwards. Navy TPS is out in Pax River. That's in Maryland, south of D.C., England has a test pilot school that we do exchange with, and France has a test pilot school. One of them is Epner, and I know sometimes your listeners will call in and tell you what they're wrong about, so I might have those mixed up, so okay, they can probably no correct me. <laughs> they train experienced pilots, NFOs, and test engineers in theory, processes, and techniques of aircraft evaluation for a career in acquisitions, or like a, maybe a tour in acquisitions. They take like your fleet experience and they kind of like wrap up. Okay, you know how to fly an aircraft, like you know how to fly in combat, you know what's required. Now we're going to take that, teach you the engineering side, and be able to communicate a problem. So you're the intermediary and you're sort of the technical expert and the representative of the government to make sure that the aircraft, the system was built correctly. So you'll hear, in, is it the correct system? Was it built correctly? Where the, was it built correctly? And you take fleet pilot from from the fleet, you put them through this year school. And at the end of all of the engineering and writing and flying different aircraft and all these experiences, you're expected to go out and fly an aircraft maybe once and look at the contractor and look at the engineers for the contracting company and say, hey, this is wrong. And from a technical expert, like this is what you need to do to fix it. Like look at your flight control laws here or you know, you misjudge the size here, something's wrong with the fuel requirements, whatever, and to have that really in-depth technical conversation with the engineers to fix the aircraft. And then you have to be able to communicate an argument to go back to Congress and the military and make a case for do we buy it or not buy it and why, or do we fund something to fix it 
because and then you give them, you know, the military application of it. Like because of this, I won't be able to do roll-ins effectively. I won't be able to get a weapon on target in X amount of minutes until you fix this to make the case to get it fixed or the buy or not buy decision. So that's like the long, big picture story of what <laughs> you're sort of like the expert go between with these two really different stakeholders, right? Well, no, that's really fascinating because you are a subject matter expert, but not necessarily on a specific airplane or its system, but on airplanes and their systems, right? In other words, you can, like you just said in your scenario, jump in an airplane, maybe fly it once and already have an idea that there's a flight control law that maybe is written poorly or some other air dynamic. I mean, that kind of blows my mind. And I think that's the big thing they build you up into the one-year course. It's 48 weeks with a little bit of pre-arrival training, and I'll talk to why we do that as well. But they expose you to, you fly everything. So as a fixed-wing pilot showing up, with a P-3 or F-18 background, your first flight's in a helicopter. And they'll expose you to, hey, this is how flight controls are, this is how you describe whatever. Does this feel mushy to you? Okay, well, what do you think that is? As pilots going through flight school, you're a compensator, right? The first time you flew a Cessna, you're like, this is really hard, but I'm a good pilot, I'm gonna figure it out. Well, we're supposed to take a step back now and say, why is this really hard? Like, why am I using so much control? Like, why am I always retrimming? And you look at the aircraft itself, and determine how to fix it. And that comes from, again, we fly, I think our class, we flew 18 different types of aircraft when we were there. They expose you to a lot of different things, and then they expose you to all the engineering behind it to be able to say, okay, this is why it feels this way. We've started to move into like advanced flight controls too, which every time I stare at a wire diagram, I'm like, this is... This is a little bit You're beyond. a mechanical engineer. I mean, come on. This should be, like, exciting. I know. The computer stuff, though, where aviation is going, which could probably be, like, an entire another, like, several-hour soapbox, is just so different than a P3 that's, you know, leaking hydraulic fuel. And, and uh, <laughs> I used to tell the, the fighter guys, they used to sit there and talk about their combat flight time. I was like, you've never had to fight anything until you've tried to fight a P3 to go flying. Mm. So. Well, don't forget, if it's not leaking, that just means it's out of fluid. That's so right. You just need some more. Leaking is good. All right. All right. So we know what TPS is, and there's a couple different ones around the world. That's interesting. I have to think maybe Russia has one or China. I don't know. Maybe? we don't. I don't think we do exchange with them. Oh, okay. So you're just We're talking about yeah. ones where we interact with <laughs> yeah. the others? Okay. I'm sure they do. Yeah. And then, so that's the what. How about the who? Who goes to TPS, and who's there instructing? So for, I'll start with the students. Okay. Um, so there's 30 students per class. You have to be board selected. So t- twice a year in, in Millington, they'll go up and you'll put up your application. You'll talk about why you want to be there. At, they'll look at your hours, how you've done in your career, how you've broken out in your community. And then they'll decide who those 30 people are. In that 30, you have a mix of all communities. They've gotten advanced qualifications. They have have 1,000 hours. They've been out. They've done the missions. They understand what they need to give back to their, like, communities I want to say community I mean like whether you're like fighter or submarine like warfare or things like that sure so out of that we're broken up to like three groups so there's rotary which is like anything with a rotor so okay, helicopters so ospreys yeah. like all flavors of helicopter pilots go into that one syllabus fixed wing so in my class we had four or five f-18 pilots one e2 pilot p3 pilots we had a Brazilian fighter pilot, an Italian tornado pilot, growler pilots, and I think that was all the fixed wing guys. And so we were all together in this fixed wing syllabus. And then the system syllabus is made up of the NFOs and, again, one or two government flight test engineers who have really shown that they have a lot of potential to do a lot for the Navy. Right. So NFO, we've said on this show before, is a naval flight officer. So it's someone who's air crew, but not actually at the control. So they are up there from a systems point of view or... Right. They'll ride in the back seat. They'll take data. And then for the mission systems testing for like any type of weaponeering or radar operation, they'll look at the display and the software interface. And that's what they focus on when they're in the test pilot school course. But still a valued contributor. And then you said there is a handful of civil government type folks who are engineers are they doing the same thing as the NFOs or what are they doing? Yeah, they go through the systems course. Rarely they'll go through the fixed wing course and they'll just ride in the backseat with us and take our data. So they're, they've been working for NAVAIR as government engineers. I mean, these are people working in 
cubicles with no windows, glasses. I mean, I don't mean to <laughs> disparage yeah, anyone, but these are the these are the people doing the real beeps and squeaks that have to be done for these airplanes to fly. These guys, they're young, they're <laughs> hardworking, they have fifty pound brains and I think for test pilot school, they usually like to see that they have some general aviation experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every like couple years, they have an opportunity to get like one of two spots in test pilot school. And they interview against engineers working on all other aircraft. So you'll have, you know, engineers from F-18 and engineers from P-8, engineers from Helos, all trying to get this one spot to be able to go through test pilot school. And it costs the government, I think, a million dollars to send them through. Oh, thank Without um, many airplanes. But it's a really great opportunity for them. And the idea is they'll stay with NAVAIR for a long time, and they'll provide that civilian leadership that's needed. The project engineer, which is what a flight test engineer who's in charge of, like, a test project, and the project officer, who's usually the test pilot, have this, like, really important working relationship to be able to get a project through test. So it's sort of cultivating leaders in that community. Okay. Now, who are the faculty at Test Pilot School? So the faculty are all Test Pilot School graduates. It's a mix of military and civilian. Some of them have done a department head tour and come back. Most of the instructors who who come back are F-18 pilots because a very large portion of our syllabus is flying the T-38 and flying the F-18 and flying fixed-wing jets. At first, we were just like, this whole thing, like, why are we doing roll-ins? Why are we doing the strike fighter mission? Like, what about props? But... Test Pilot School was actually started as an answer to the Navy lining up for the jet age. There's a great book, Harnessing the Sky, which is uh, about Frederick Trapnell, the Navy's first jet pilot. Okay. And I read that halfway through the course, like on a Christmas break. And I was like, okay. And I complained a lot less because I realized that Test Pilot School existed to sort of get us ready to start flying jets. So when we weren't going to our props, it was a little bit more manageable. (laughs) Well, without insulting you, I mean, I think if you can fly a fighter and do the roll-ins as you were talking about, which is simply your maneuver from level flight into a dive to drop a bomb, and a lot of the other things you have to do in a fighter, well, you can probably do what a P-3 Orion does, which is mostly straight and level, dare I say? Oh, no. No? 200, down at 200 feet, putting buoys in the water, flying patterns, 60 degrees angle bank, no autopilot. I all right, all right. could not believe this was always great. And I always talk to my friends, big wing guys coming through after me. My first flight in the F-18. I was like, this is going to be awesome. I was like, I'm going to fly an F-18. And if you've ever flown a P-3 before, it takes like I'm four not. people. Right. So you've got like one person like holding the rudder and the flight controls are really heavy. You know, it's like this <laughs> reversible aircraft. You've got another person calling at your speed. You got a guy like pushing your power levers all the way up. You've got somebody in the back making a hot pocket. Like it's a huge <laughs> endeavor. And it's just and like, the coffee. and the coffee, it's like your mm. hand flying the whole time. And I mean, if you imagine, if you have experience flying Cessnas or any kind of multi-engine, there's always, you're always making rudder changes, you're always doing these things. My first flight in the F-18, I took off and I was like, really? The flight controls are amazing. Like it is an engineering feat of excellence. Like that aircraft is awesome. But I came back and I looked at the F-18 guys in my class and I was like, really? And they were like, it's not how it flies. It's what you do with it. I was like, okay. And like the 13th time they tried to explain to me like how I'm supposed to set up for the merge. I was like, okay, all right, fine. Like you win. But yeah. And find the E2 as well. If you've seen the E2, it's got props. It's got like four tails. It's little like a sports car, but it's like flying a dump truck. Like that thing, that's a pilot's machine. Like I can't believe they land that thing on the carrier. So. I did have a chance to do that in the co-pilot seat as air wing operations officer in Japan. I did get to respect that <laughs> ability because it was impressive. And they do it regularly quite well, actually. They are frequently the top 10 ball flyers in the air wing. They're doing air refueling now. Uh, that's over right. Over packs, which is pretty impressive. That's right. All right, so you said earlier a lot of test pilot graduates end up in the astronaut program. Mm -hmm. So who are some famous TPS grads that the listener might recognize? Do you know any off the top of your head? Uh, Well, Scott Kelly, he just did a year in space. Like a year or something in space, right, and then wrote a book? Mm -hmm. Okay. Like most astronauts. But if you've seen the right stuff, the original astronauts were test pilots because they wanted a way to break people out. And while fighter pilots who have gone through Top Gun and Weapons School, those guys need to stay out and fight wars. I think that test pilot school is a discriminator because of the engineering background. I would think the ability to analyze what's going on and to assess 
where the problem could be. Because if you're up in space, of course, you don't have someone who can just fly up next to you and say, oh, look, your gear is hanging down or something, right? I mean, they want people who are self-reliant and analytical, I would think. I think so. And it's been, I think they have to find a way to break people out, right? They had 18,000 people apply on the last board. Wow. So. All right. So that's the who. Let's go on to the when. And you already touched on this. So it's a year long class. It's 48 weeks. It's about an 11 month course. There's a course that starts in February and there's one that starts in late July, early August. So the board meets in February and July to pick people for the next class. And that's Navy and Marines. And they'll typically have a spot for, you know, the other services or partner nations. And then we have like a little pre-arrival course where they teach prop guys how to fly jets and jet guys to get back into flying props. And then everyone in the fixed wing cell this, we need to get qualified in the T-38 because you just, the T-38 has less desirable handling qualities. They want to get all the students 10 hours in the aircraft. So you're used to flying it. That's usually the rule. You need about 10 hours in the plane before you start signing for aircraft Mm -hmm. when you get in the flight test. So that's the pre-arrival stuff, and it kind of just gets everybody ready to get started. Some people may not be coming off of a flying tour. So it's a 48-week course, and it's made up of engineering, writing, and flying. They like for people to have an engineering background. People have gone through with, you know, backgrounds in English, but it's a little bit difficult when we start doing the mechanics and the dynamics and the calculus straight from the beginning. So... The joke is, from like a time management perspective, half of your day is spent on engineering, half of it's spent on writing, and the other half is spent flying. So uh, wait a minute, hold on. Public education, okay, half, half, and a half. All right. So in other words, you're really, really busy for 48 weeks. It's really busy. The flying, just like everything, the flying's the most fun part. Sure. We fly about 18 different aircraft. There's a field trip in the middle where we go out to Edwards to Air Force Test Pilot School get to fly the F-16, get to do the shuttle approach in the T-38. We'd fly gliders while we're on that trip and seaplanes. The flying is incredible. And a lot of the time you're just flying with your friends, going out to try to do these really difficult test points and get data to come back and write about. Flight test is an hour of flying maybe, and then three or four hours of writing about the flight. So you start to learn that the hard way from the beginning. But the flying is just incredible. So you you fly all these different aircraft, you learn all the engineering, you learn the lingo, you learn how to write, how to communicate an argument, and it's all like a buildup. So once you've had all these experiences, you get to your DT2, your developmental test two, which is this capstone. And I think you mentioned you knew somebody in the Air Force that went through test pilot school or went through Air Force test pilot yeah, school. Yeah, our episode one guest, Sunshine, he was a Navy guy but went to the Air Force test pilot school. I think they do a different final project. The Navy project is awesome. So if you ever meet a Navy test pilot, ask them what they did for their DD2 because those stories are always incredible. But you put in your, you're like, okay, I'm, you know, this is like, would you like to travel out of the country for your DT2 for me? Yes, I would. <laughs> and then, you know, you put in your preferences of what you think aircraft they're going to get selected. And then they tell you, this is your aircraft, and you have about a week to put together a test plan that covers every aspect of this aircraft for a mission that you're going to evaluate. You go out, you do maybe two flights with this aircraft with another student, and you guys share your data. And from the when you land from your last flight, you have nine days to turn in a report that covers everything that you've tested and basically whether or not the Navy should buy it. So it's an academic exercise. It's still really difficult. For my DT2, I went out to Finland and flew the Hawk, the Mark 66 Hawk, which was basically a T-45 with a bigger engine and better avionics. And if I could have just written that in my report, it would have saved me a lot of time. (laughs) Yeah, I'm guessing they wouldn't accept that. (laughs) Definitely not. So that was a really long nine days. And it was cool because the cool thing about the mission that I was evaluating it for was it was the advanced flight trainer with carrier operations mission. So I was almost recreating that initial test they did for the T-45 by. So I thought that was pretty awesome. And then when I was out in Finland, they had a couple other aircraft that their military flight test program was like, do you want to just go fly our other planes when I was there? I was like, <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of writing to do, but I'm not going to turn that sure, down. Of course. So that was, it was just an awesome experience and I'm glad that's over. So you finish that and then you're a test pilot. How long was your report? I think... When I finished, it was around 161 pages. Okay. So. That's, that's, I, I passed. 
because I'm here. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So it worked out. But looking back now, it was really cool. It was very stressful at the time, right? But it was pretty awesome. So the DT two, as you call it, these are real world scenarios or proposals. You're not just going out and solving something that you already they already know the answer to, right? It's an academic exercise, but they want to give you a mission that you might have not thought about before, and they want you to fly something that's different than anything you've flown before. We had guys flying, you know, the Eurofighter, the L-39. They flew the Mirage. So it's just getting that experience and showing that, hey, no matter what your background is, no matter what community you're coming from, we trust that we could put you in any aircraft, and within a week you could give us an answer. And that's, that at the end, that's, that's pretty confidence building, like going into the test community, knowing that if something showed up, they could call anyone who's a test pilot school grad, and you could just go and do that. Right. But the way they get a graduate to that level is by selecting people who have fleet experience with at least 1,000 hours, and they put them through an arduous 48-week course, right? I mean, if they just took someone fresh out of flight school and it was a month-long course, then you wouldn't have the same product at the end. So obviously, you particularly are a benefactor of all that hard work in flight school and a very long and sounds like not complicated, but I don't know what else other word to use, but, but a very strenuous syllabus. Yeah, it's very difficult, um, and they want everyone to get through, right? Because at the point when you finish, there's a job waiting for you on the side. They didn't pick you just because it's just like, yeah, you, you were good enough to be picked. You're competing for a job, but they picked you because you actually need to do flight tests for the Navy. So there's guys that don't get through, and they're really good pilots. They're really good sticks. They just, at some point, they couldn't do the engineering or they had trouble with the writing, I think, is like the, the hardest thing for a lot okay. of people. And they'll go back to the fleet and do their job, but the the idea is you have to get through this course so they know that you can represent a good argument. And we actually focus a lot on ethics too, which um, hmm. which is important in the whole Navy, right? Ethics sure, is always course. important. But they have to be able to trust you to know that you know when you're working with billion dollar programs that you're going to do the right thing and and make the right call because these are people's lives at the end of the day. And it's government taxpayer money. Right. Yeah, both of those are important, for sure. Okay. All right, so next up is where? You already said that the Navy's test pilot school is in Pax River or Patuxent River, Maryland. What's that, about 45 minutes outside of D.C., I think, right? Yeah, a little bit more, about an hour and 15. Okay. But Pax River is close enough to the D.C. area where you can go up to the Pentagon. You can talk to the decision makers. But it's far enough where you're mostly outside of their influence? The, <laughs> I wouldn't say the populated areas, but it, I really like Pax River. So okay. I gave you, um, but it, at the time, it wasn't a very populated area, so it was okay to be doing things as dangerous as flight test. Okay. Yeah. And it's surrounded by water, right? So you can get to your overwater ranges very easily. Very easily. Not super populated in that area. Okay. And then you already said the applicants come from the fleet, but where do the graduates go when they leave test pilot school? When you graduate from test pilot school, you'll go to either East Coast or West Coast. So East Coast is aircraft division. West Coast is weapons division. Weapons division is more focused on weapons, obviously, by the name. Uh, East Coast, we, we're doing a lot of the air vehicle testing and like the initial weapons separation testing, which I don't know if you've ever thought about who tests your weapons before you get them, but there's a whole string that you have to go through when you first get started. How the weapon separates from the aircraft, is it going to come back and hit it? I had an opportunity to sit down with one of the test pilots from, I think it was F-4s. They were losing a bunch of F-4s. I guess I have to go back and confirm this before I go into it. But uh, they were losing all these aircraft. They didn't know why. And it was actually a weapon separation problem. They had never done weapon separation testing. And when the weapons were coming off, they were coming back and hitting the planes. Ooh. And it, they did their weapons separation testing after the fact to go back and fix the aerodynamics from the weapons were separating. I was like, that's crazy. So aircraft division, weapons division. Aircraft division, then it'll be based on the community that you came from. So if you're F-18s, Joint Strike Fighter, or Growlers, you'll go to VX-23 and Pax River. Big Wing, you'll go to VX-20. Helos, you'll go to HX-21. And now with... Drones, if you're going to be doing drone testing as that community starts to come up, they need people to test their equipment too. There's a new squadron standing up, which I think it's UX24, hmm. and that'll be starting next year. That's in Webster Field. It's a little bit south of Patuxent River. Okay. If you go to the West Coast, you can go to China Lake, which is VX31 for developmental test, or you can go to VX30, which is in Point Magoo, and that's 
P3s and I think eventually E2s and C130s. And most of the test for that is still in Pax River. Okay. And so you are, in any of these jobs, employing the instruction you just received. Mm -hmm. And you might have some sort of project that you are responsible for during your tour there? On your test tour, you'll have s several projects. And what's also really fun is you'll have several different aircraft. You can also fly any aircraft that are in the squadron. If there's availability, it's on the flight schedule. Uh, my current projects are both actually manned and unmanned. I fly the P-8. I transitioned to the P-8 in VX-20. The, when I was in the fleet, only one or two squadrons had it. Now you'll see the P-8 in most of the fleet squadrons. The P-3 is slowly being phased out. And the P-8 is, correct me if I'm wrong, a 737 adapted to patrol, anti-ship, anti-submarine. Is that too simplified? No, that's perfect. Yeah, okay. the P-8 is a 737 with an 800 fuselage and 900 wings. Okay. Okay. Um, and it's basically been adapted to replace the P-3. For those of you guys who are really into the fighter stuff and don't know what a P-3 is, the P-3 is a four-engine turboprop aircraft. It's a submarine hunter, and it's been flying since the 1960s. And it's just, like, it's the fact that it's still employing and going out and getting the mission done is pretty awesome. So I transitioned to the P-8 at VX-20. The Navy's just starting their drone program. It's going to fall under maritime patrol at this time. So the MQ-4 Triton is a part of VX-20, and as somebody with a maritime background, I also work on that. I have several projects over there, and I'm the air vehicle lead, so testing is split between air vehicle and mission systems. Air vehicle will be like performance, propulsion, flutter, loads, testing. Is this thing going to fall apart in the air? And it doesn't, which is great. And then I'm also a chase pilot, so when other aircraft go out and they're doing their first ever flights with new equipment or they're doing a dangerous maneuver... They'll need a chase pilot to tell them, hey, something just fell off of your aircraft or to be able to take over the comms. Anything. It's sort of like a formation when you have a wingman, mm -hmm. but you're there from like a, a safety perspective and you're kind of taking care of a lot of the admins so they can just focus on the test. So drawing a parallel maybe here, like when the space shuttle was flying and you'd see it come in for landing when they used to televise it, you'd always see the little T-38s flying close by. Is that similar? That's safety chase. Okay. So they're just, again, they're making sure that everything's okay on the aircraft. Sure. And again, it's probably similar to what your wingman will do for you. Okay. Hel helping ensure that the pilots can just focus on the test. Okay, sure. And then having this degree and diploma or whatever you would call it, I mean, it's almost like a PhD in aviation. This has to, I think, be a benefit for you the rest of your life. I mean, we already talked about people translate this into an astronaut career. But if you decide to get out and go apply to any of the major aircraft manufacturers in the United States or abroad, I mean, is this, I'm guessing, an asset to have on your resume? I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I think so. I've started, there's been opportunities that have been presented to me just simply from having the diploma. Mm -hmm. I've been through a really specialized school. I've had training that's very expensive and very unique there's a lot of programs that need test pilots, both manned and unmanned, that require this type of training. So I'm, I'm really lucky to have had this opportunity. You know, the FAA has test pilots. For the airlines, I think all their testing is internal. So you'd start working at the airlines and then do the test there. I've worked with test pilots from Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and a lot of them had been military test pilots, done their career, and then got out and started working for the contractor. And then there's always research projects that come up. So I'm really interested in the space community and what's going on and sort of how that's emerging. And so opportunities have come up to be like, hey, will you look at like our flight controls because like you have a test pilot school background. So it's allowed me access to more of aviation. And it's just really ignited like my passion for aviation and getting to see so many different aircraft, meet pilots from so many different communities and see where aviation is going. So it's, it's been awesome. Oh, I can imagine. And that sounds pretty interesting. I mean, this would only, I would think, open doors for someone to have. I don't, can't imagine it would close any doors. But you just touched on, and something I wanted to ask you is, you, and you alluded to this before, I mean, many different aircraft are on the test pilot school line. But, I mean, do you, what, what are there, and do you fly all of them, and what are some of the cool ones you can share with us that you've flown? So the test pilot school currently owns the T-38, and that's like our primary plane that we do most of our events on. A T6 Bravos. They have the U1, which is the oldest plane in the in the Navy. It's like piston engine. <laughs> it's so much fun. Like an old mail carrier or something? It's like a yeah, it's a tail dragger. It's 
<laughs> terrible on the ground. It's just so awesome. They've got a couple gliders that you can do aerobatics in. If you haven't done gliding, I think the first couple of times I was gliding, I was like, we have no engine, but it ended up being fine. The aero, aero like doing aero, going from aerobatics in an aircraft where you have all these minimum altitudes and things like that for control to doing, you know, loops without anything to back you up. Like, okay, well, got to be really good at energy management. Um, they've got UH-72s, which is like the Eurocopter, UH-60s, Limas, which is the Black Hawk, OH-58 Charlies, C-12s, you have to do a little bit of multi-engine stuff, even the fighter guys. They've got F-18 Foxtrots, which is a lot of fun to fly, as you know. Mm -hmm. And then one of the projects they're working on now, so they have this, this company, Calspan, comes in. They have this Learjet. This is actually pretty neat. I don't know why I didn't think about talking about this earlier. So they have this Learjet where you're sitting in the co-pilot seat, and they can make, they have a yoke, and then they have a side stick, and they have these different controllers, and they can change the feel of the controller to just about anything, to teach you how to diagnose what the problem is. So let's say that the response rate, they can change the response rate to slow, and you can try to fly the aircraft and be like, okay, well, do you like it? And it's like, no, well, why don't you like it? It's kind of like a guessing game. And so they can change it to almost be like any aircraft, and you try to go through and figure out what is wrong with it and what you don't like about it. So it's almost an airborne simulation where they can put something in that they know what it is and then make sure that you can see and feel it and learn from that? It is, and they give you targeting tasks. So you uh. have this little like sight that they put in the cockpit, and you'll try to do different targeting tasks and realize, hey, I wasn't able to you know, shoot down that cloud. Well, why? Well, I couldn't roll fast enough. Well, why couldn't you roll fast enough? And you kind of work backwards to see what what the problem was. So hmm. that's that's one of the programs they have. And then they have a SOB, which I think they're replacing, and they have an F-16 radar in the back. So one of the flights you'll go do is you'll sit back there and, and mess around with the radar and do different radar test techniques because where aviation is going, everyone needs to understand software. Everyone needs to be doing the mission systems testing, even if you're a pilot. A lot of the air vehicle stuff is still important, but there's becoming more of an en emphasis on the computer-based, the mission systems, the displays, the human-machine interface. Well, I can imagine. How about artificial intelligence? Do you guys touch on that at all? So when it comes to AI, Test Pilot School leads the research on how are we going to teach people how to use this, how are we going to teach people how to evaluate it, and how are we going to teach people how to evolve it to meet the needs of their aircraft. So the research usually starts in that syllabus, and then as those pilots learn it, when they come into their test tours, they can apply what they've learned to their aircraft as that stuff starts to develop. Sure. So probably no two test pilot classes are instructed in the same way because technology is changing so quickly. I mean, obviously it has to adapt. Otherwise, we'd still be teaching the stuff from 50 years ago. That's why it's great when you get new test pilots in every six months. So that kind of energizes the squadron when you have new guys coming in because they sort of have a different attitude coming into if you've been with an organization for a while, the culture can start to stagnate. And because we get test pilots every six months, they come in with fresh eyes to say, hey, why are we doing it that way? Has anyone ever complained that that looks like that? This isn't how this is supposed to feel or look or fly. So that's a really great part of having that constant influx of new test pilots. I can imagine. And after such an arduous experience, I mean, is your class pretty tight, I'm guessing? Do you keep in touch with a lot of your fellow students? Oh, we had an awesome class and we had a really, I think our, <laughs> I think our, like all of our attitudes were really similar, even though we had all these different experiences. And one of the intangibles is when you're sitting around, like not doing your homework, you're listening to people talk about, you know, this army helicopter pilot, like his first time flying in Afghanistan or this tornado pilot from Italy doing low levels. Like everyone has really cool stories. I mean, we were such a close class and we have a group chat that we still keep in touch with. I think we're planning our next reunion. I also see that from senior guys that are still like, oh yeah, he was my test pilot, cubicle mate, and like, <laughs> we're getting beers. We have, if you're ever in PAX, we'll go to the flight deck lounge. I'll show it to you. Okay. But that's like our TPS bar. Work hard, play hard. Work hard, play hard. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. That's common across all aviation activities. I wanted to ask you, PAX River is the where. Is, are there any other wares? Do you have outstations or debts or anything in other places? As far as debt stations, when you first are learning about being a pilot, I, what was your commissioning source? I was ROTC. ROTC. So 
did any of the pilots who were like your ROTC instructors ever tell you what it was like to live on a flight schedule? If they did, I've since forgotten. Yeah, it's like when you first start talking about being a pilot, people were like, being a pilot is so awesome, but they never mention what life is like on a flight schedule. It's kind of like test pilot school. When you go through test pilot school, everyone tells you all these things about your test tour. They don't tell you how much travel it is. So, you know, obviously we have all these different aircraft. We don't have any simulators in Pax River. So you're traveling for simulators. Test pilots will travel to the major contractors during early stages of development, whether that's St. Louis or Seattle for Boeing, Rancho Bernardo for Northrop Grumman or St. Augustine, and have to get a really early look at the technology. So it's not really a debt site, but it is a lot of traveling for meetings and to see the technology early, because the earlier that you can start to detect issues, the earlier things can start to be fixed. Sure. All right. Well, that's Gosh, I mean, I've learned a lot out of all this. I had no idea about TPS. I guess I kind of thought when I was a junior officer deciding where to go, I thought I wanted to go to Top Gun because I wanted to be not a jack of all trades, but a master of one, in other Mm -hmm. words, tactics. And what I hear you saying is, because my fear was that test pilots were kind of a jack of all trades, but you really are a master at analyzing the aerodynamics and the systems in an aircraft and then being able to communicate that to someone who has either the ability or purse strings to fix it. I mean, is that not to overly simplify test pilots, but is that a fair assessment? Yeah, no, you nailed it. And when we're talking about if, hey, does this meet like a new tactic, they, we definitely reach out to the the top guns and the weapon schools of the communities to make sure that we are developing to what their needs are. But you are specialized in Again, knowing the technical side, being able to analyze the aircraft and communication. No, that was absolutely a perfect summary. Wow, awesome. All right, well, gosh, I mean, I know we could go on and on about this, and I'm sure there's a lot of great stories. Although you kind of punted on my, uh, what, so what was the coolest airplane in your mind that you flew in TPS? So I loved every aircraft oh, that I got to on. fly. Like the MiG-15 was just, was crazy. Just who gets to fly a MiG-15? You got to it fly was a pretty MiG-15. awesome. Who has a MiG-15? Some. <laughs> Are you not allowed to tell me? Some bro. Uh, okay. They, they contract these companies to come out. Um, flying the SNJ T6, when it, like the original training aircraft they used right. for the carrier. I remember I was getting really close to, it was one of my most memorable flights. I was getting really close to the capstone. So I was trying to take as much data in a shorter period of time. And I was, we had the canopy open. And for those of you who have done like aerobatics in general aviation, I had never done aerobatics with the canopy open. So going, I'm like, all right, here, going up for the loop, like the control forces building. Oh my gosh, this <laughs> is so awesome. You're just like looking at the ground. You're like feeling the air around you. I was like, this is just incredible. And the air speeds are so slow in the pattern on the downwind coming in for the pattern. I actually like had my arm propped up. Like I was driving my car, just like outside the my, canopy, out the canopy. That was just incredible. But <laughs> and this was an SNJ. You said it was SNJ T6. Oh, cool. It was wow. so much fun. Definitely not like in the pattern. Cause that thing's really squirrely on landing, but, and I feel so cliche saying this. I got to fly the F 16, which is just awesome. It's like just this huge engine. Like you're just, there's just so much power. It's just oh, an yeah. awesome aircraft. But my favorite aircraft is the F-18. I think the engineers and the test team nailed it. It's just what you can do with it is phenomenal. We got to do the out-of-control flight syllabus, like explore all the different corners of the advanced flight controls. It was just if, if a pilot could design an aircraft to just make it what they wanted to be, I think it would be the F-18. Well, I'm going to go broke because people are going to think I have to pay you off for all these comments. But no, that's pretty cool. I obviously spend a lot of time in that, as my listeners know. And But it sounds like in your few hours, you got to do things I never got to do, and that is intentionally depart controlled flight with the F-18. So what, spins, uh, tail drags, or I mean, what'd you do? Absolutely. We did spins, tail drags, you just wow. putting yourself in like situations that you could accidentally get in yourself, starting right. to pull over the top and then getting slow and then pulling through it. It's actually pretty hard to spin, but it's, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's pretty awesome. I think we've got a convert. We better not play this for the rest of your P8 community because yeah. they're going to think you want to like switch that. over. All right. Excellent. All right, Recky. Well, let's wrap this up. I mean, I know we could go on and on talking about TPS and all the different sides to it, but I think we've covered most of the good stuff. What's next for you? What's, what's the future hold? 
Well, I'm really enjoying my current job as a test pilot, and I'm looking forward to what the Navy has in store for me. The Navy's been really good to me. I've been really fortunate, and you know, I'd like to continue to serve the, to the best of my ability. Eventually, I'd like to go to the astronaut program, so I'll be working towards that. My master's degree is in space systems engineering, and I'm trying to sort of like explore what that career would look like, and hopefully I'll be serving the Navy from NASA. That'd be cool. Now, is there something you're waiting for to submit your applications, or have you already? The boards meet about every four years. Uh, oh, wow. So I think there's, there was a board while I was in test pilot school. I think there's another board coming up. I know at the last board they had 18,000 people apply, so it's not very competitive, but we'll see how the next one goes. Okay. Well, best of luck to you on that. Thank you. All right. Well, we've come to that part I've been waiting for. I have to know how someone came up with recce, as in a rec, I presume. But if you've listened to the show, you know that we have our guests explain their call signs at the end of the episode. So, recce, please tell us your story in that regard. So I've kind of been dreading this part uh -oh. um, as much as you've been excited about it. So recce rhymes with Becky. Of course. And it's uh, short for train recce. I think people hear it a lot. They're like, <laughs> recce, like you're trying to like doing reconnaissance. I'm like, no, it's, it's oh, for so not train R -E -C -C -E, recce. Oh, so not R-E-C-C-E recce, but W-R-E-C-K-Y recce. Yes. Okay. Um, and I guess the podcast version <laughs> is being stationed in Hawaii as a junior officer in an awesome wardroom. It's probably like being in college, but actually making money and not having any homework. So we had a lot of fun. We partied quite a bit, and I'm sure just based on that, you can understand where somebody <laughs> would end up with the name Recky. <laughs> that is awesome. I, I wish I could implore you to share some of that, but for your own benefit as a future astronaut candidate, Thank you. maybe it's better not to have that in the public domain. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Well, gosh, any parting shots on TPS here, Recky? For anyone who's thinking about test pilot school, 100% go for it. It's a great career, and we always need uh, good people in the test community. Outstanding. All right. Well, I want to thank you for your military service on behalf of my listeners. I want to wish you all the best of luck in your astronaut candidacy. Hopefully, we'll see you on the news someday when we start sending our own ships back into space. <laughs> I think we're dependent on the Russians right now. And it's just been really fun to learn about you and TPS. So thanks for coming on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Yeah, thank you for your time. Okay, let's get out of here. Thanks again to Recky for coming on the show. Hope you enjoyed that. I learned a lot, and I know you did too. Just a couple of follow-up things here. When she said the word Edwards, I assume you understood that meant Edwards Air Force Base made popular in that movie, The Right Stuff, where basically most of the show took place that wasn't part of the space program. It is where Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier, etc. Anyway, that is in the desert north of Los Angeles, California. Also, Nav Air, that is the Naval Air Systems Command, just one of the many subtenants of the United States Navy that takes care of various things. And on their website, it says, quote, the mission is to provide full life cycle support of naval aviation aircraft, weapons, and systems operated by sailors and Marines. This support includes research, design, development, and systems engineering, acquisition, test and evaluation, training facilities and equipment, repair and modification, and in-service engineering and logistics support, end quote. And then other famous test pilot school graduates, well, according to Wikipedia, you've got the astronauts she talked about, Alan Shepard, Scott Carpenter, Jim Lovell, Wally Shira, John Young, John Glenn, Pete Conrad, etc. Then you also have, like she said, Mark Kelly and even Jim Stockdale, a famous POW who was a vice presidential candidate for a while. So a lot of smart and famous people have come through that school. I want to remind you that the views expressed in that interview and this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. And that's pretty much going to do it for this episode, folks. I hope you enjoyed it. Just the one parting shot. We do have new Patreon strike lead Marvin Carger, who has signed up to help us out. And I hope you'll consider that. Take a look at patreon.com. Look for Fighter Pilot Podcast. Don't forget to check out our new website. And there's ways to help support the show there as well, or just to consume the content. And if you have any feedback on that, please let us know. That'll do it for this episode then. We'll see you next time here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. See ya.
Thank you for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on all the usual social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content and to help support the show, visit our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and share us with your network. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating or a review on iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it. Did I handle that okay? Yeah. <laughs> I is your dad, I uh, assume, alive? Uh, forgive me for asking that way, but yeah. is he going to listen? Uh, probably he knows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone knows. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear me. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, at least I was going to assume it was, and I didn't want to go there because I try very hard to keep this show PC, yeah. but, you know, wrecking marriages or something or something. No, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. I was like, someone's like, tell them it's about wrecking ball. I was like, that's not going to look, yeah. that's not going to do well for female aviators if everyone's <laughs> associated with Miley Cyrus's wrecking ball. Yeah, exactly. All right. I'm actually recording by the way, so, but. Uh, <laughs> Got it. That's fine. That's fine.